Hello again, everybody, and welcome to our third case study on fatigue and pallor. This is a patient coming in with fatigue and pallor. If you haven't had the opportunity yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. I have the link below in the description of the video, and you can also click on the I button in the upper right-hand corner. I appreciate all the contributions I can get to help offset the cost of these videos. Thank you very much in advance for your consideration. All right, so we got a 52-year-old Hispanic man being brought into the office by his son for a six-week history of fatigue. He's generally healthy, but his son says that he suffered from depression. The patient has suffered from depression since being demoted at his job four months ago. Since then, he's been consuming four to six alcoholic beverages every evening and eating primarily fast food as he has little time to cook. The patient says that he gets about eight to nine hours of sleep each night and has no difficulty falling or staying asleep, but is constantly sleepy and has frequent headaches and a hard time focusing at work. The son says that the patient has recently had difficulty remembering appointments and names of familiar people, and he's concerned that this may cause problems at work. The patient is widowed, works as an accountant, does not smoke or do recreational drugs, is on no medications, and has no significant past medical history. Vitals are all within normal limits, and the BMI is 29.4. So, at this point, if you're on CCS, you need to figure out what you're going to do for your physical examination. So remembering that on CCS, you're going to keep your physical exam short and sweet in more emergent cases, and if you're in the office, you can do a more comprehensive physical exam. So uh, what do we see? Well, general, no apparent distress. Skin, we see pallor, all right? Uh, lymph nodes, no lymphadenopathy. H-E-N-T, we see pale conjunctiva, enlarged and reddened tongue. Uh, thyroid looks normal, chest and lungs clear to auscultation, cardiovascular examination is normal, abdominal examination is normal, rectal exam, stool is occult negative, extremities we see palmar pallor, uh, and then the neuro and psych exam uh, we see delayed deep tendon reflexes. So now at this point you need to formulate your differential diagnosis. We've got a patient who is pale, who's tired, and is slightly confused. In addition to that, we know that the patient is consuming a lot of alcohol and has a kind of a funky diet. All right, so what is our differential diagnosis? Well, the number one differential for a patient with pallor and fatigue is, of course, anemia. Now, anemia comes in a lot of flavors, so just knowing it's anemia is not going to help you. You're going to need to get a lot of labs. First of all, we need to confirm the diagnosis of anemia to begin with, but anemia is definitely at the top of our differential. Major depressive disorder, possibly. We didn't ask him all the questions, but that could be it. That could be behind the alcohol use. It could be there. It could be concomitant with other causes of anemia. Well, not that major depressive disorder causes anemia, but it could be there in addition to all these other things. So that's something to consider. Hypothyroidism. Hypothyroidism can cause fatigue. It can also cause a normocytic or even macrocytic anemia. Alcoholic liver disease could be there. Typically doesn't cause fatigue, but it can cause anemia. Obstructive sleep apnea. He's sleeping a lot and he's still tired. That is common with obstructive sleep apnea. He's also a little bit on the porkier side, BMI of 29. Usually we see OSA with much bigger patients, but it, it, it can happen in, in slightly overweight patients as well. And then chronic fatigue syndrome, kind of a, uh, a diagnosis of exclusion. Okay, so at this point, you know your differential. What labs are you going to get? All right, so our initial workup, anytime you think anemia, you got to get a CBC. I mean, that should be common sense. But in addition to that, on CCS, you need to add a peripheral smear. We have to get that because we want to look at the morphology of the red blood cells because that's going to give us additional clues. We want to get a reticulocyte count. A reticulocyte count will tell us, okay, the patient has anemia. Is their marrow responding properly? 
We want to get serum iron, TIBC, and ferritin, and all three of these should be part of your initial workup for anemia. Uh, we're going to get a PT and PTT uh, just because there is a possibility of bleeding. Um, so that can be useful to get. Probably not the most important thing, especially if the patient's not on Coumadin or any kind of blood thinners like that. But it, it would be good to get. Since this patient has alcohol abuse, LFT is probably a good thing to get. And since we're considering hypothyroidism, you want to get a TSH. Patient is fatigued, so TSH could be useful. What do we see? All right, we see the, the CBC shows a hemoglobin of 9.1, that's low. Hematocrit of 27.8, that's also low, so we know the patient is anemic. Now, the next thing you're going to look at when you know the patient is anemic is you're going to look at the MCV. The MCV will tell you, is this microcytic, is this normocytic, or is this macrocytic? And if you know that, then you can narrow down your differential. What we find on smear is that there are macrocytes and hypersegmented neutrophils. I want you to hone in on that because if the patient has hypersegmented neutrophils, this is not only macrocytic, but it's megaloblastic. And as we're going to see, the differential gets narrowed down from that. By the way, I'm assuming that you kind of know how to do your workup for anemia. If you don't, go back to my hematology videos. I go over this in really much greater detail ad nauseum. The reticulocyte is 1.2%. So the reticulocyte count, that should more be percentage, I guess, but the, the, the percentage of reticulocytes tells you if the bone marrow is responding properly. In a non-anemic person, we would expect it to be around 0.5 to 2.5%, maybe 2%. Uh, if it's above that, we would consider it in an anemic patient, we would consider that to be appropriately elevated. If it's not elevated, it suggests that there's a problem with red blood cell production. And so that's what's going on here. Uh, the iron studies show a serum iron of 180. That's slightly high. And the TIBC and ferritin is normal. Now, it's high because there's probably some difficulty with erythropoiesis, and that's going to leave iron in the blood. Uh, the PT and PTT is normal, liver function test is normal, and the TSH is normal. So what, at, at this point, what are you going to do now? So we know that we're dealing with a macrocytic anemia. So what do we need to do? When you have a macrocytic anemia, particularly a megaloblastic macrocytic anemia, we're looking at nutritional deficiencies. And so the two nutri nutritional deficiencies that we're looking at are B12 and folate deficiency. So you can just go ahead and get serum B12 and serum folate. That's good. That'll probably be good enough for CCS. But you should also get MMA and homocysteine. If you know your biochemistry, you'll know that MMA and homocysteine are elevated in B12 deficiency and only homocysteine in folate deficiency. Again, go back to those videos in hematology if you don't understand this. I also have some biochem videos too if you want to get really deep into it. All right, so what do we find? We find that the serum folate is low, the MMA is normal, and the homocysteine is high. This is a folate deficiency. So anemia in the adult patient. Anemia presents with fatigue despite adequate sleep. They have pallor, they're sluggish, and often they're confused. The differential is enormous. So the first step that you're going to take is to ascertain whether it's microcytic, macrocytic, or normocytic. And what's going to tell you that is the MCV. The MCV and peripheral smear are most helpful for determining the class of anemia. You need to know the most common differentials for each type of anemia. We're only going to talk about uh, nutritional deficiencies causing macrocytic anemia here, though. So for macrocytic anemia, the two most common causes are folate deficiency and B12 deficiency. Uh, it can also be caused by hypothyroidism, alcoholic liver disease, alcoholism, and myelodysplasia. 
So conjunctive pallor is going to be something that you want to keep an eye out for when you suspect anemia. Now, this is really useful because if you've got a patient with darker skin, let's say, you know, you got a black man, you're probably not going to notice pallor in the skin in the way that you would notice it in a white person. So looking at the conjunctiva is really useful. This is what it looks like normally here on the left, where you kind of have this nice pinkish red color, whereas with pallor, it's a very, very pale pink. You can also look at the palms. So if you look at your palms, you should be able to see the palmar creases, which is what you see here on the right. This is normal. Uh, with pallor of the palms, those are going to be a lot harder to see. So our diagnosis here is anemia secondary to folate deficiency. Any kind of anemia secondary to nutritional deficiencies often present with neurologic or psychiatric signs. However, the neurologic signs are going to be much more prominent in B12 deficiency. B12 deficiency, they tend to have sensory disturbances. They may have a loss of vibratory sensation, fine touch, proprioception, stuff like that. Whereas folate deficiency does not really have the neurologic signs. They may have some confusion or memory loss and maybe a headache. The causes of folate deficiency are as follows. They may have diminished consumption due to a bad diet. Alcoholism can interfere with that. So diminished consumption. Increased utilization could be due to hemolysis. It could be due to pregnancy. Malabsorption. Think things that interfere with absorption in the small intestine, so celiac disease. Gastric bypass, remember the Roux and Y gastric bypass kind of bypasses a lot of the duodenum, which is where a lot of folate is absorbed. So look out for that. And then medication side effects. Here the big one is phenytoin, okay? Phenytoin directly interferes with folate absorption. Some other things that can cause it would be anything that modulates the purine and pyrimidine pathways, so cancer drugs like azathioprine, mycophenolate, fludarabine, hydroxyurea, methotrexate, trimethoprim, lots of stuff there. Further testing will depend on concomitant symptoms. So if the patient has diarrhea, you will probably want to get titers for celiac disease. If the patient uh, is a woman and maybe she had her period two months ago, you might want to check her out for pregnancy. So again, you're just considering other symptoms that are present and you'll have to work your way from there. In this case, it's fairly straightforward. We have a guy who's drinking a lot of alcohol. He's eating fast food. Remember that folate comes from fresh fruits and vegetables and certain foods that are enriched with folate. So he's probably not getting enough folate in his diet. It's very easy to develop a folate deficiency. You only store a few months worth of folate. Whereas with B12, it takes a lot longer to develop that deficiency because you store a lot of B12. So our management for this patient is pretty straightforward. We're gonna replace the folate. We can do that orally uh, because this patient does not have any signs of malabsorption. Uh, we'll probably add thiamine and B12 supplementation just because we know this patient is an alcoholic and or is at least drinking a lot of alcohol. Uh, and so he's at risk for thiamine and B12 deficiency. So we'll add that on preventatively. Every time in CCS, if you've got a patient and they're telling you they're drinking a lot, they're smoking, they're overweight or obese, you've got to do the counseling part. So you're going to counsel this patient regarding alcohol use. If he was a smoker, even though the smoking isn't contributing to this, you would counsel regarding smoking cessation. You could probably counsel him about diet or send him to nutrition. That's not super important though. Follow up in three months. You got to know that three months. Why three months? Well, you're not going to see improvement right away. Uh, we're going to be looking at the reticulocyte count. We're going to be looking at the MCV. We're going to certainly be looking at the hemoglobin and hematocrit, but it's not going to get back to where we would consider it to be normal for three months because that's how long it takes red blood cells to turn over. So we will follow him up in three months and repeat the CBC. This is your differential for the different kinds of anemia. We were here, megaloblastic, because we saw those hypersegmented neutrophils. I don't have a picture of that, but a hypersegmented neutrophil is where you've got more than six lobes on the neutrophil. Um, so 
Again, you can go back and watch my hematology videos if you want more about this. So just to recap, anemia in the adult patient, the presenting signs are going to be fatigue despite adequate rest, pallor, confusion, or memory issues. The CBC will invariably show low hemoglobin and hematocrit. That's the sine qua known. So obviously you're not anemic if your hemoglobin is normal. MCV is indispensable and will narrow your differential down. Always get a reticulocyte count when evaluating for anemia. That's going to be particularly important when you're dealing with a normocytic anemia, uh, but it's good to get no matter what. An appropriately elevated reticulocyte count, meaning over 2.5%, usually points to blood loss or hemolysis, which are typical causes of normocytic anemia. Further workup of anemia will focus on the most common causes. So you got a microcytic anemia, you really want to hone in on those iron studies. If you've got a macrocytic anemia, you want to hone in on folate and B12. MMA and homocysteine can also be useful. Nutritional deficiency is the number one cause of macrocytic anemia, particularly in alcoholics. Alcohol can suppress the bone marrow. Vegans, Vegans often don't get enough B12 because it tends to be found in animal products. Malabsorptive states because the intestine is responsible for absorbing these things. And those on certain medications, namely phenytoin. Folate deficiency commonly coincides with headache. Anemia coinciding with disturbances of other lines. So if they've got low white count, low platelets, that warrants suspicion for heme malignancy. Those patients should be sent off for a bone marrow biopsy. We didn't need to do that in this patient because his platelets and white blood cells were normal and he had a pretty suggestive history of a folate deficiency. Treatment is supplementation with the appropriate vitamins and follow up in three months to ensure normalization.